Hey there, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome back to Painting Big with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied voice, Justin, who is currently from the grave. Well, if he was here, because I have totally forgotten to put him in my ear. But he's not from the grave, really, because he's going to get coffee. And coffee will resurrect him. And by then, I'll have him in my ear, and he'll sound alive. How's everybody going? How is your Friday? Yes, I am very happy it's Friday. I have a lot to do this weekend, but kind of catch up, since I've been trying to... The only problem with adding Twitch into my thing is that now I've got things to do to like get up to date on the Twitch and add emotes and deal with that and yeah, there's I've been doing a lot of things. Plus yesterday I just needed to clean the house. You know how the you know how the the, the house clutter builds up until you, your brain explodes and you're just like ah you must do something. Yeah, that was me yesterday. After I ran my errands, I was just like cleaning. So, binge painting all the Nagendra. Good job, Inara. Friday, the only day of the week that's not Monday. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, purpley can. Or purple I can. Purpley can. <laughs> I don't know why I read it as purpley, but I do. Because it's me. Yo, Coops, how's it going? We are, we are here. We are here, and we're going to um, base a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, when you've got animals, you know. Hey there, planer. So, Planner, do you want a spoon emote for, for my painting big uh, Twitch? I was thinking about what a, a spoon with dragon wings. <laughs> work is work, huh? Work is work. Yeah, my house gets, well, David and I's house gets dusty just because Kiri, when you've got a dog. <laughs> that could be fun. Draconic spoon. All right, let me see what I got here. We're going to do some stuff. We're going to do some stuff. We're in base. We're in a base. It's fun. Fun and exciting. Alrighty. So let's just go over to Cam. I'll talk to you guys. Dust happens. Dog fur. Dog fur definitely happens. I'll give you that. Oh, oh, hey, my butterflies from Greg. I found, I found, um, parchment things. This is not a butterfly base, though, so we shall replace the butterflies in the basing bag. The random, random basing bits bag to be alluritive, as we always like to be. And I'm trying to grab just a little piece of cork and I've got a bunch of random bits in this bag I like to keep random bags I've got a bunch of barrels her starts barrels and stuff too but I don't think I want to make a brinewind base on her but if I do a brinewind model that I feel is really like good on a dock then maybe we'll use our barrels and boxes at some point your car is dusty my car is super dusty because of all the pollen out here and the trees dropping stuff on it like I love you redwoods but you have totally painted my car like ugly colored. <laughs> I need a car wash. Pretty bad on the element. <clears throat> but then I'd have to actually use my parking place and not park in front of the building, which is far more handy. It is not a fifth Monday. Come on. Come on, Daffodweer. It'll It's going to be better than that. It's going to get better. It's, uh, it's, uh, being, being alive on this day is better than the alternative. How about that? I'm going to be horribly upbeat. You'll all want to shoot me by the end of the stream. But I actually feel like I got sleep last night. Kiri only woke me up once. <laughs> it's all it's all relative, right? If my dog w wakes me up in the middle of the night when she has a her Kiri emergency, uh, but at least it was only once this time. Mm-hmm. Oh, construction projects. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of Kiri emergencies, we we are almost certainly going to get Kiri butt signed today because uh, she had a very small business this morning, so. I'm I'm keeping a raised eyebrow tilted in her general direction. So we're gonna use our green stuff today. We're gonna use some cork today. So we've got a couple of bases here, and we've got a decision to make. So we've got our we've got snack snack lady, and she's almost done pa being painted. So I feel like I can throw her down on a base at this point. I definitely this is hard to hold without you know rubbing paint off so getting around a bigger base you know is nice i can take her off of the sticky tack surface and uh, have her on something that i can actually hold that's not going to rub off um yeah so the first question is size of base right so we could do she totally is is too big to fit on your little standard rounded lipped etc like, you could do it, but at that point, you have no room for basing whatsoever. She still looks fine on that, so she's just a gaming piece. You totally could do it. She overlaps the, um, she overlaps the edge, 
But because her base is round anyway, she still looks good on it. So you could do that if you wanted to. But we don't want to. We want to be more creative than that today. Let's see where are my bases. I keep all my basing stuff close at hand so that in a, in a cubby that where I know where it is so that whenever I have inspiration to build a base, I have what I need. Um, I keep a separate bag of bases. The second base we could put her on is this sort of thing, which I think is a Reaper. Yeah, it's a Reaper miniatures base. Uh, SKU number 74048. I really like these, this base, I really like it. Like, I like the rounded lip a little better for a presentation base, but, um, for, uh, for just a little scenic base, I really like this one because it is flat, it's got no, no slot to deal with, um, and it's a little bit bigger, so, you know, most models, most Reaper models will look great on this sort of base. It's, it's just a really fantastic, you have a little extra room for basing usually. Like, she's very, very large on the bottom, but if I were working with something like the Duelist or something, or, um, hmm, let's see, even Herbalist would have a lot of room. Juliana would even have a lot of room on this sort of base, so. I really like this base for 28 millimeter Reaper figures. Because look at all that space I've got now. I could really build out around her with some foliage or things like that. Um, or put her up on a little hill and, you know, even put a couple of little more, a couple of additional forest animals. <laughs> since she's got, uh, since she's got, you know, hedgehogs with her. So it would be kind of fun because we have a really cute bunny, among other things. The Reaper's got some great little familiar animals that would go great on this if she was like friend to forest animals. Um... So this would be a cute little base to do. And this is just the right size. And what you're looking for here is something that's not, not too small that you can't set a scene, but not something that's too big. Like a, a lot of people might be tempted to put her here. Now, the problem with this is that the base area is larger than her base area. And what this means is that you would better be building an interesting scene that tells a story with all this area. If you're just planning to landscape it and plop a couple forest animals on it, you don't want the big base. You want to tell your story in the minimum room you can. Um, yeah, let's see here. Um, Merc, usually these days I just green stuff around. Like, I'll just make the model. I usually want the model up a little bit. Here, let me grab Duelist. We actually did a green stuff base on the Duelist. So, like, for her... She already had a cobblestone integral base, so what we did not long ago is build her... Hold on, let me get her in focus. Do, do, do. In focus. There we go. So what we did is we built her like kind of a cobbled curb and then just filled in this bottom area so that we could just suggest it's like a cobbled street or whatever. Um, and so that's what I really like to do because removing these integral bases can be a pain in the butt and you can risk the model... Like, you're clipping around the feet. Is There's always the chance that you're going to gouge it out. And when it's a metal model, like she is, um, then you're, you're just, it's just hard, right? It's just hard. Uh, uh, our metal is very high tin these days, and that means it's very tough. Um, so it's not like in the olden days when we used horrible toxic lead. Um, and well, le high lead minis are super easy to clip stuff away from. But the more tin you get in your mix, the more durable the miniature is, the less corrosion you get, and also the um, the harder it is. So that's why it's really hard to do conversions on metal nowadays if it's really high tin. It's a lot harder than it used to be. Um, so instead of trying to clip away that integral base then, I'll just use it as kind of a, a way to raise the miniature up a little bit, and I'll sculpt over it. I'll figure out what scene or thing I want, and I'll just do that. And uh, hey, good morning, Paul John's Life. Yeah, right, exactly. Plus, it's a pain in the butt. It takes a while, and you're probably using, you know, using all sorts of tools that, you know, you're like, these aren't perfect for the job because nothing is. Um, and, and yeah, so I pretty much just use it as a base now. Because because I've gotten comfortable using green stuff, um, well, you could use Ava's epoxy sculpt. You know, there's a couple of other things you could use. But I just sculpt over it. Like, if, it, if the base itself doesn't have what I want on it, like, if I had decided not to use cobblestones and her base has cobblestones, it's super easy to put a really thin layer of green on that and just put gravel and grass over it if you have to. I mean, if you're just looking for simple, right? It's, it's very easy to just make her up on a little hill. Um, so that's what I tend to do. I do it not just with Reaper stuff, but with, like, my commission work. So I've got some, um, 
some uh, Song of Ice and Fire models from Dark Sword coming up for commissions. And Jim always wants me, Jim from Dark Sword always asks that I put the models onto a plastic base and just do something with it. So I end up sculpting additional rocks or scenery or whatever seems to be in character for the model. So, yeah, exactly. I, I usually use, I don't use so much flocking. I use static grass uh, usually. But, I mean, I use, actually, I've got a great blend. Have I talked to you guys about my blend before? I don't know if I have. I think I, I did way back in the day, but I'm not certain where it is right now. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can get it because it's a, it's a great thing for more natural basing. Let's see if I can find it. Is this it? No, that's sand. I have a whole bunch of stuff over here, and it's like, where is my blend? That's David's. Is that one? That looks like David's, too. Arg! Anyway. Is it in here? Nope. All right, so what I have, and I have temporarily mislaid it, but it's got to be in one of my basing bins, um, is I have a blend of flock, really fine sand, and two different levels of flock, like slightly puffier and really, really fine. And then static grass and some like spices or, or leaf litter, whatever you're going to use, you know, the little uh, seed pods that look like leaves. But I think there's also like just some, some oregano or whatever, just spices that look like tiny leaves or leaf litter. And I mix that all up together. And there's probably not as many leaves in it. Like it's got, you know, a little less leaf intensive. If I wanted to do a very leafy base, I would just use straight up without a mix. Um, or I would layer it over the top of this. But if you mix together a bunch of different types of basing material, you can get some very natural looking turf bases just from laying down a layer of glue and, and sprinkling that stuff over it. Um, I like the mix because it's it, you wouldn't be able to do it manually, but when it's all mixed up in the tub and you just dip the miniature into it and sprinkle it over the top, it looks like real ground, real turf. It's got a mixture of, of textures. It's got a mixture of heights. So it's a lot more, it's still fast, but it's a lot more interesting. Um, and it's really good to just suggest little puddles of uh, foliage, like growing up between uh, bricks or, or whatever, stones on a base, things like that. Um, but yeah, exactly. So doing a mixture, I do find the static grass is, is a, a large part of that mixture because I do want some grass and stuff, makes it like it projecting out of my turf. Um, I don't like turf just straight up. I like, a, I like a little varied texture, but you know, go with what looks great to you. Everybody's got a different solution. So, Hey, mighty Garrett, thank you for the sub. You're a real boy. Well, you're at least three months. Um, I don't know. I never used them twisted Oma, though. That's kind of gross. <laughs> I mean, anything for texture. The big thing with coffee grounds, though, is make sure that they're fine enough in texture. A lot of people use really chunky stuff for basing, and it really looks out of scale if you think about how big those particles would be if you grew... Like, if you imagine that this is a, a real person, and then you imagine how big that rock chunk or, or sand chunk that you just put on would be if you were in real life and looking to kick it out of your way. So... Do keep scale in mind. That's why I tend to go for ultra fine basing materials and introduce chunks of bigger materials. Like I use fine ballast and then a larger, like a medium ballast or heavy ballast mixed in. Um, but I always try to go fine for my first layer of texture. Then build it up if you want to. Hey, Alpha Zero. Thanks for the sub. Thanks for the resub. Seven months. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, use coffee grounds if you want. Just, you know, if it looks good to you, use it. I just tend to go for regular basing materials and then do custom mixes that, to me, look good. Um, as long as it looks good, use it. I mean, the one thing I, th I hate, the one material that people use that I absolutely hate to see on a base is cat litter. It's never fine enough. It's always chunky. It's always dusty. And it's just, it looks bad. <laughs> like, I, I can't think of a base that cat litter looks good on. Like, it may be a really big model. Maybe you'd be able to use it for some realistic texture, but oh my gosh, that used to be in, in, uh, in Vogue and, and I just, I, I can't help it. I just think it looks bad. So being honest, straightforward here. Alrighty. So back to size choosing. So you want a base that gives you a little room to tell a story. And this base does not give us any room. <laughs> she fits wonderfully on it. So if you wanted to just put her again on a nicer base that wouldn't rub off while you're playing with her, then this would be great. I would use green stuff to fill in this gap around the edge and to blend her little edge into the edge of this base so that it looks like she's naturally on this base. Um, but it doesn't give us any room to do any scenic landscaping. Don't consider cat litter. 
Right, but it's still, I've never seen it look good in Aura. I never have seen it look good. It always looks chunky and out of scale to me. And it always is, uh, I, um, shall we say, a little bit too evident of what it is. I don't know, maybe I just got an eye for cat litter after years of owning cats, but um, there are other things you can use. <laughs> I would much rather the coffee grounds than the cat litter. Uh, at least the coffee grounds smell good. Good morning, Outer Mama. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yuck. Yeah, see, exactly. To use it and make it look good, you've got to grind it up. And then it's like, well, that's way too much work. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't bother. I've got, it, when you consider that even if you buy expensive basing materials, even if they're expensive, they're going to last you forever unless you're painting entire armies in a matter of every two weeks. Like, I, I bought basing materials, you know, I bought it over the decades, and I still have, like, way too many basing materials. So... Because you use so little on every base. Unless you're building, like I said, big dioramas or you're doing a lot of armies, then I could see you running out. But it's just so... Like, I had to buy a snow, like the Games Workshop snow texture paste the other day because one of my clients wanted me to use it. And I'm like, I am never going to use all this. <laughs> it's going to be still sitting here 30 years from now. I'm still going to have my original bottle of snow texture paste, assuming I can keep it alive. So panko is the problem with using anything organic like that liquid nebula is bugs. Um, it bugs in and just general like breakdown degeneration over time, right? Uh, I mean, it's like panko is, is just wheat and, you know, a bit of fat probably to hold it together. So you right away have the risk of rancid fats over time and uh, general degeneration and breakdown. The paint will seal it to a point, but I don't know what that where that point ends. I would never use any food stuff other than like dried spices, which is just like, you know, leaves, dried leaves, which is not nearly as attractive to insect life. Um, so, yeah. Not so much all about the panko. <laughs> you could use cornmeal if you wanted. Uh, cornmeal is a little bit different since it's an it's it's a a grain that's just ground. It's not like processed like wheat. Uh, corn is pretty indigestible even to people, <laughs> unless it's treated right. Um, so uh, so maybe cornmeal. I don't know. I still I shy away from food stuff. Why use food stuff when you can just use sand? Um, I don't see the reason to use to use anything organic that might break down or mold over time if water gets into it or a little bit of moisture does. Um, I just don't even want to. I don't know, Moon Glooms. I mean, your mileage may vary, right? I'm telling you why I shy away from it. You can keep using it if you want, but if at some point you notice that you are in, like, have a humid spell in your area and suddenly you're noticing little specks of mold on your bases, you're going to know why. <laughs> um... So yeah, I mean, it's, it's whatever. It's whatever. I mean, I, I would say seal it very, very well with paint. Um, that's all I'm saying. If you're using something food, I just, I just, uh, I've never seen the point. I've just rather use just the stuff that it's like people using floor wax in their paints. I'm like, it's floor wax. I could buy a bottle of, you know, of, of matte medium and I still wouldn't use it all. And I'd pay a little more, but I would be using something that's used for the intended purpose. You know, it's like, I would always just rather buy something that's supposed to be formulated for the intended purpose. I've never seen the uh, point of some of these shortcuts. I've, I'm just like, stuff when, I mean, I get it if you're really, really on a tight, tight, tight budget. Okay. When you're a college student, all bets are off. Use whatever you can. Because <laughs> you have no money. Uh, so I totally get it there. But when we, when we have a decent income and we love our hobby, it's just like, uh, why not just get exactly what you want that's going to work exactly the way you want it to? Um, so that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Expanded shale. I've heard that. Yep. Yeah. Landscaping materials, when they're fine enough, Pendrake, can be really good. I've actually had that some of that expanded shale for my bonsai soils. They use it in bonsai soil, soil often. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a mud texture that Games Workshop does too that I picked up again yesterday. And it's like, once you get the knack of working with it, you can, the nice thing about texture paste is you can sculpt with them. So you can actually vary the surface and make, you know, various like sand dunes or, or, you know, raise like drifts with the snow and things like that. And you can, and you can smear it down and it'll stick. And, you know, so there's some good things about texture paste for sure.
Yeah, Moon Glooms. I mean, I, like I said, it's it's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you. I just, I always look at a little bit of scans and go, so, is something going to try to eat this at some point in the future? Some microbi microbiorganism and, uh, you know, I'm going to end up with moldy bases. <laughs> and then some people will probably look at that and say, oh, good, mold. Now I can spray it with, uh, with dull coat and uh, dry brush it. <laughs> so, you know, um, whatever works for you, man. Whatever works for you. I, I, all I could do is give you guys my thinking about this particular topic. I know that many people disagree with me and use whatever comes to hand that works for them as a, a, totally fair, totally fair. Um, it's all good. I just like stuff that isn't going to like, you know, like I said, break down mold, uh, get eaten by things, you know, stuff like that. I'm always, for that reason, I'm always uh, careful. Like I, I tend to, uh, I'm not very good at delousing stuff I pick up in nature. So I'm always a little suspect if I'm looking at a root or a piece of bark or something in nature, whether I'm going to be able to effectively delouse it. Um, probably putting it in the oven would work, right? I can look up articles on how to do that. But but I tend to be nervous about that sort of thing also because I just don't want bugs. Bugs in my mini. They're out of scale. Yeah, so cool. All right, well, let's see. So now we're looking at Snake, and we're like, okay, well, this is too small if we want to tell a story. It's big enough for her if we want to tell a story, but it's not not big enough for Snake. So what we're looking at now is, again, the difference. And we've pretty much got two base sizes that I have that um, that would fit. And the, I think both of them are in Reaper. This is 74030 base, this one with the beveled edge. And then this one is 74033. I think one of them's a 40. Um, I'm not certain. A sizing on these is, is like, I forget all the time. Um, oh, the shale for Automom asks, uh, who puts it out? You can find it at a garden stores. Um, just ask for expanded shale, Automama. Uh, usually, like, I found that, that, that lawn and garden stores, um, several of which may be open now because a lot of them are outdoors. Uh, have bags of expanded shale. The biggest problem is you're going to pay for a big bag of shale. The, the, yeah, I mean, it's going to last forever, pretty much. Oh, yeah. 24 hours at 150? That's good to know. Thanks, Chibi. That's a long time. But, yeah, I could see that. 24 hours at 150 degrees. That's really good to know. Because uh, out here, now that I actually live somewhere with, with cool basing materials, like, at my doorstep, so to speak, I'm going to write that down. 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours. Delousing. I can see why you don't want to burn it. Delousing, bark, etc. Great. Now I've got that in a handy sticky note that I can keep in my basing bag, and that will remind me. Thank you, Chibi. And and now everybody else knows, too. But yeah, I mean, some people, like those of you who live in Colorado in areas where there's awesome bark and stuff, like, you're so lucky. And it's not bad here. Like, the redwood bark is nice and shaggy, and it flakes. So I think I could pick up some really nice bark, now that I know how to do that. That'll kill COVID, too. Great! Ah, uh, that's true. So maybe for 10 hours. Maybe all day. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a lot of power, right? to try to cook something for that long, but electricity bill going up because I'm delousing things. I'll just have to wait until I have several things to delouse. Uh, I have an idea. Oh, you have an idea? Yeah, you could, uh, do you have a vacuum sealer? Uh, no, I don't. Because I don't have well, a sous vide. Well, you could sous vide this stuff. So you <laughs> could sous vide stuff all the way up to 200 and something degrees. Yeah. So you could absolutely, like, sous vide a piece of bark as long as you vacuum sealed it. D. Clearman, I didn't know they sold bark on Amazon, but I guess for animals and pets, like lizards, it makes total sense. Now I want to go on Amazon and just buy myself a, a bark. Yeah, I don't have a dehydrator, so. So, yeah. Yeah, that's all. These are all good ideas. These are all good ideas. Alrighty. So, Snake Lady on the base. So this one is nice. Its downside is that it has a slot. So if we use this one, we'll have to deal with that slot somehow. Um, if we're going to glue something down, of course, things like that, it's going to seep right down. So we have to we have to block up the slot if we're going to do this on the snake. Otherwise, this is a very good size for her. She It is not double her size, so it's not too big. Um, 
if we look at her kind of sideways on, it's a good size for her. Like it's not, again, it's not double her width, so, it's, so it doesn't look too, um, too big. And it gives us a little room to tell a story. If we look at the next size up, and this is nice because it doesn't have a slot, so we can build right in it and we can even pour fluids and things like that without worrying about it seeping down anywhere. Um, I know you want to go check them out. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you soaked them in super glue, then I think you're going to be fine, Moon Glooms. I mean, super glue, if, if you really have a solid layer of glue and paint sealing in those particles, it's going to be a lot harder for any moisture or anything to get in there. Um, so Snake Lady here. Now, this would definitely be a diorama base, right? It's, it's kind of the difference where now we've got a lot of room. So if we're going to, it's it's not quite, it's not twice her area, but we're getting there, right? We're getting to where there's quite a bit of area out here. And if we wanted to use this, we would definitely need to build out some, there would have to be a reason to use this space. Not just that, you know, it's big and we want to sculpt some rocks. Like for me, this is a little bit too big and it needs at least some scenic basing to suggest a place. Um... The, yeah, super glue is a really good sealant. It, well, it makes sense, right? They developed it for sealing cuts and you don't want bacteria to get in there. So it would make sense that your cornmeal would be just fine soaked in super glue. Um, slot blocking of sprue. I, I, because bases are, aren't our main business, uh, I think, Pendrake. And uh, I mean, it's an idea. You could suggest it to Ed and Ron on Reaper Live. That would be the people to suggest it to. But instead we make like no slot bases. So it's like, I don't know why we would, because otherwise it, you it, you could choose to go here and stay here. The problem is that there's they're not exactly the same size, right? Like, that's my problem, is that often Reaper will make a, a slotless base, but then it won't be exactly the same size as this one. So Snake Lady is better on this base, but I don't have much room. <laughs> but I have a slot to fill. Um, and here, this is just maybe a little bit too big. The other thing to look at is you always want to look at not just how the model sits on there, but how it looks down here. This is a very wide base. And so it's not, again, it's not quite double her width. Although if you look at her verticality, like her average width, it is double her width. Um, so to have her look good on this, I might need to raise her up a bit. So you can do that if you've got a big base and you've got a story in mind and you're like, well... This model just seems to be shrinky dink when I put her on this base. If you lift her up and build her up on a platform that kind of goes down into the space, that looks a bit better. Like adding a little height if your model seems kind of shrinky dink on a base will help the base look better. So I could sculpt some stuff and fill in this gap and raise her up. Um, I was going to do a little bit of a pool. Like I kind of wanted to do like her in a cave setting with some irregular rocks and maybe some pooled moisture. Um, so now I'm looking at these with that in mind. I could probably put a small pool in here or just little spots of pooling between stones on this kind of base. I would get a lot more of a scene here if I had something in mind. Yeah, I use, that's just a tister, right? I don't need a, a thing to peg into the slot. Um, I just need to use some green. Actually, you know what, guys? Here's the trick. I don't even use green half the time. If I'm just going to put a layer of super glue down and putting flocking or something over, guess what you can use? Stickers or sticky notes. It's enough blocking. It'll block enough to hold the glue because the glue will stop and it will soak into the paper, but it will not go down there. And so super easy. Just trim your edges, throw down that, put your glue down, put your gravel on, you're done. <laughs> it seriously works. Um, cause you just need something to stop the fluid from soaking into this slot and getting down and gluing your base to the table and the paper, the fact that it's got an absorptive quality. I like stickers a little better than sticky notes, but these days all I've got are sticky notes. So that's what I would use. Um, you could also use masking tape. That's another great one. And that actually has a plasticky, uh, surface. So that will stop the uh, glue even, even better. Um, so super easy. Who needs a sprue? Who needs a sprue insert? <laughs> Just grab your sticky note or your tape or your whatever, drafting tape, duct tape, doesn't matter. Just, you know, the one tape I don't like for this is scotch tape, the thin plastic, because super glue will melt it, in my experience. I have tried almost everything um, on this. So if you don't want to work with green or you're saving your green for your actual sculpting on the base and you don't want to use it to fill up your slot, put down a piece of paper or a sticker and just go. Simple, easy trick. 
labels work. Like if you have label stickers for your printer. Yeah, those are, I used to use those all the time, but these days it's sticky notes and I just figure out, you know, what I'm going to be doing. If I'm going to like glue her down, I'll put down this first and then I'll do my gluing or do my putty work or do whatever. Um, if I'm just going to sculpt with green, then I might not do this. But it, anytime I need to like just fill in a slot and plop a mini down and I don't want to have to deal with these crazy ends, um, I'll just put the paper down before I glue the mini on, down and do the basing. So quick tip, cheat tip, life hack. Painting hack, basing hack. There you go. So I always kind of felt like I was cheating, but it worked. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paper clay works too, sentimental. Um, and the nice thing about the sticky note or the tape is it's very neat. You can, you know, you don't have to mess around with a, a goopy or mucky thing. You, you just kind of put it down and use your X-Acto knife to slice around the inside. And usually you can cut it really easily to exactly the shape it needs to be. Yeah, sure, that that involves having a 3D printer, Xandercles, which is not my thing. I do not have that. Yeah, Image, I was just sharing the life hack of, like, putting just a piece of tape or a label or a sticky note over this to fill the, to keep the slot from uh, from your super glue from leaking down or your or your white glue if you're doing basing. Um, depending on the kind of glue you tend to use for basing. All right, so now I have to make a decision. I have looked at the pros and cons. If I use this big one, then I have to, I definitely need to do more scenic basing. I might need to introduce um, like sculpted elements to suggest a, it really at this point is how much of a scene do I have in my head for her? And I really don't. I really just wanted a little bit of an environment. Oh, I think we've got dog emergency. Dog emergency, guys. Oh, no. Yep, yep. Yeah, Gergi. I just put a sticker over it. I find, why work with green stuff if I can just put a sticker over the slot? Super easy. I think, yeah, I think we've got Kiri dog emergency. So I'm going to take her out really quick, guys. Um, and uh, then uh, I figured this was going to happen because she just didn't have all of her business this morning. Yep, Kiri. I know, I know. So, yep, yep, the tail's going. All right, so I'll be right back. You guys have fun. Uh, and then when I get back, I will commit and start. Sorry, bro. I'm, I'm working on something. I know we got a, a be right back screen here. I know. That's why I hopped in. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. I'm back. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was typing up a long, extensive email. Um, how is everyone today? Good. Uh, I'm working on ribbons right now for ReaperCon. So I'm working out the best way on how to get that. So uh, we're taking suggestions. So if you're on the Discord, head on over there and start putting in your uh, ribbons suggestions. We already have quite a bit. So. Oh, like different types of rigid, rigid, different types of ribbons, or um, the way that the ribbons work. Uh, no, like uh, like suggestions of ribbons. So like uh, the way that it's gonna work is that you'll see a huge list of all the ribbons and you'll be able to click a reaction to get that ribbon. I think that's the current way that it's going to be set up. So I'm just taking suggestions of what people think uh, the good ribbons would be for Discord. Hmm. My favorite so far is uh, Future Sacrifice to Mare Saluth. I really like that ribbon. And I, Pirate School Dropout. <laughs> I think we need a potato job ribbon. 
Uh, I'll think about it. Everyone type a one in chat if you want a potato John ribbon. <laughs> if you type one, I'll ban you. <laughs> no, no, don't you type one. He can't ban you. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at all these potato John ribbon requests, John. Look at this. Uh, dyslexic, dyslexic lemons. I'll assume that was supposed to be a one. <laughs> okay. See, look yeah, at that. Dyslexic. Look. Uh, these are virtual ribbons, Twisted Doma. Um, they're not going to be the same as the normal in-person ReaperCon, of, of course. Um, but it, it's just something to do. Um, I know that a lot of people wanted ribbons, and this is this is the only way that I can see to do it right now. <laughs> with so. Is everybody learning about a, a lot of stuff about basing today? There's a uh, there's a really good discussion going on on Twitter right now uh, with all the miniature people, and they're talking about how we can get the younger generation into miniature painting. So uh, if you're not on Twitter, or if you are on Twitter and you're not following us, that there's a lot of people talking about that currently. It's a big open discussion. How was your morning, Justin? Doing great. I just received a very strange email. Ah. Very strange. I'll talk to you about it later, but it's uh, I, I got a, I got a, some some sort of. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I got some sort of soft invite to a uh, to a CS:GO tournament that I've never seen. Ah, I see. Before. And uh, I've just never received an email like this. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm just cleaning up the Discord. I just cleaned up the directory. So when you guys see that, um, I don't know if this has been announced yet, but the official ReaperCon 2020 Discord will be launched on August 31st, I believe is the current date. It is the Monday before ReaperCon. So we'll we'll have a whole week to kind of iron out and get all the information out there for people. I think it's going to be really good for people to get in and, and start asking questions and getting things filled out before the con actually happens. It's kind of a way to, I guess, uh, alpha test, <laughs> alpha test it. Uh, Super Ego 1989 says, any idea if we are getting a look at the Daimyo, uh, Daimyo set? Um, I believe um, I haven't seen any of the prints here, but I know that he will show them off and take pictures as soon as we get the first production prints of them. Um, so there you go. Yes, Otter Mama. Uh, it's a good. That's a good point, Otter Mama. I need to recheck the schedule. Yes, we've added a few more things, uh, especially into the third party section. Uh, there's a lot of the Fort Waffle stuff going on. If you guys who know who Wapelius or James Waffle is, and Kathy Waffle as well got added to the list. Um, I believe there was also one more panel that was added uh, on Sunday, I believe. Let me go look real quick. I have it pulled up. Yes, yeah, Sunday at 5 p.m. in Classroom 1. And it's about uh, campaign planning for tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, yeah, Margaret, I do have a lot of suggestions to read through. I've been copy and pasting them into a uh, notepad, a PDF file. So when I get a chance, I'll start adding the ribbons when I can. Yeah, I was I was curious if that was ever going to pop up and be a potential issue. Uh, and I think Tister kind of highlighted the potential for it to be a problem, but. Uh, the fact that there was obviously two different different discords, one for ReaperCon, one for Reaper proper, and uh, and uh, Tister was was unaware of which Discord they were in versus the um, the actual ReaperCon Discord. Um, ah. But uh, and I imagine Tister will not be the only person, so that that may be something um, if you're you know for the mods to kind of make them aware that 
people may think they're in the one discord when they're not yeah um that is very true um this helps with the title as well so reapercon 2020 is the official reapercon discord uh instead of having them both i guess having the reapercon on the main reaper miniatures discord we didn't want it to get all cluttered right right and i and i agree with that it's just uh in planar that's that's yeah that's that's normal <laughs> um this is really more from a standpoint of people who've never used discord uh no tister it is the reapercon 2020 is the official one reaper miniatures is is the official community one uh but the the reapercon one is reapercon 2020. that's and a good question the image. Top left. john do we plan on keeping the archon server going or do we want to like lock it down and then reuse it or? uh so we're going to push everybody out. Uh, so we want everybody to join the Reaper Miniatures Community Discord. Um, and then the ReaperCon Discord will kind of go down for maintenance and kind of hide everything. So that way we can use it for the future. Uh, so that way we already have this backbone and we can always just build on, on it from there in the future. Yo, peeps, so, yeah, I'm I... back. All right. Later. Later, everybody. Later. Thanks for helping, John. Alrighty. And my dog is thoroughly emptied, one hopes. Hi guys, I'm back. Yes, sorry for the, uh, the Kiri, Kiri eruption, Kiri interruption. We did not have a Kiri catastrophe. Alright, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna commit to this smaller base. I don't have a big story idea in mind. If I had some, um, some basing features like little statues or idols or something to like see that say that she was in a temple then I might be tempted to use this bigger base but because I'm just looking to put her like kind of in a place and a time I'm not going to go for the bigger base because really um then I've got to come up with with a bigger story to fill this bigger base but remember you always want to like tell your story in as little space as you can so I want to put her in a scenery to suggest where she is but I don't have a, necessarily a story to tell. I don't have a sacrificial victim or uh, or any other, you know, other stuff like temple dressings or things like that. I'd have to sculpt it all if I was going to do here. And that's not what I'm looking to do today. So now I can still decide that I want to put her up a little higher on this base because it'll give her a little bit more height. It'll make it little, her a little more imposing and uh, give me a little room to like sculpt like rock features and maybe make a little pool down at her base and things like that. I think that's kind of fun. I like that idea. So I'm going to go there. Um, the first thing we're going to do, of course, is do exactly what I just said I was going to do. In, in case you thought I was jazzing you, this is actually what I do. Grab my X-Acto knife. Super easy way to quote unquote fill a slot on a base and I just grab that and I just try to tamp that down and let's see where's my slot there so I don't want to I only want to use the sticky part of the paper so yes this is wasting a sticky note which you know is a terrible thing a sticky note is a terrible thing to waste but I can get more and I do I do survive on my sticky notes like what I would do without my sticky notes so we got that all cut out more or less and wherever we got it kind of imperfectly cut out, we can come back in and kind of trim it very nicely with an X-Acto knife and lift up the edge and just kind of peel it off. Ta-da! If you really want to neaten it up because you hate little ragged corners, feel free. There. All right. So now we have this nice surface here that even if we decide to put down like a puddle of glue, it's going to keep that glue from going through here. It's going to absorb into the paper. And unless you really saturate it, it's not going to drool down the inside of that slot, which is what we want. So very nice and neat, easily done, easily covered up. Perfect. And it only cost us 30 seconds instead of trying to mix up some green stuff and then put it down or smash some putty or whatever. It's just really simple. Yeah, I mean, just get labels. I mean, I used to use printer labels all the time for this, Panthera. All the time. Let me see. You got to get out some sculpting tools here. Got a whole bunch of things. So one thing that um, I see people do often, and I myself do, and David does, is uh, use cork to build bulk and then green stuff around it. So really, you're just at that point using the cork for a filler to create some space easily and quickly. 
and then you are going back and you are green stuffing around the cork to seal it in. Um, it uh, just essentially using it for height or for bulk. It's often used on like rocky bases because the thing about doing rocks is that they're really heavy. Like almost all materials that you would use to do a big built up stone base are very, very heavy. And so if you're going to transport this to say a convention or, or you even to your local game store, just to show it off, having it be heavy is not a plus. So for Snake, we will probably use some cork to braise her up a little bit. And if I feel like it, I could uh, use irregular pieces of cork that would suggest, you know, a particular shape of stone. I don't want it too regular, but this is like a quick, fast way. Make sure that it fits on the base. Um, but this is a good way to just kind of find a way to raise her up a bit. And then it's really easy to just build this up. So I have to ask myself now, compositionally, is this enough height? I think it is. It raises her up nicely. I think if we went higher, she would be way too tall for this base. So you're always kind of looking at your height to width ratio um, is what you're looking at. And I try to, uh, I used to have a rule about this that the base shouldn't be X uh, amount high, like one third or more as high, uh, one third or less as high as the figure is what I would say. So I could go maybe higher, but the, the higher I go, the more I should really be using a bigger base. Um, probably unless she's, it's different if you've got a model that's sitting on top of a column, right? And that's the point of it. Um, then you could use a fairly small base for your foot and, and go vertical. But here I'm just trying to like create, create some rock formations that are more interesting than just having her sitting on a flat base. So, um, Cybestorm, I have two types of cork that I use for basing. One, I believe is a three eighths inch, the thick brown stuff that I've shown before. We have a link to it. Uh, bulletin board tiles, quartet bulletin board tiles. And what those are, let me grab a piece of that to show you is that's very thick and chunky cork. So here it's got big chunks, you can see. And then I use just the coaster cork that you can get at any Hobby Lobby or Michaels usually. This is the stuff they sell to make homemade um, coasters. Uh, and so you can see how much smaller the chunks are on this. So really it's about scale at that point. If I'm going for a very large rocky base, then uh, for a larger model, I'm almost certainly going to use this because it's going to be in scale. As I'm building out my base for my Valkyrie, I am using the big cork. Big cork. When I did the um, Frost Giant Queen base, where I built it out on the side, wanted it to kind of look like she was looking down the side of a mountain from her like half-ruined castle, I used the big chunky cork for that as well. But then I, on this, I used the smaller cork for the back, for kind of a base for the background here that I could carve into, sculpt onto, and do that. So I used both kinds of cork on this base for two different things. So it really depends on how big of a granular texture you want to get from your cork um, and how big, of a, how big of a surface you're trying to bulk out. I'm going to go and put this back one second. Make sure I don't lose any pieces. That's always the bad thing. <sighs> but yeah, so it really just depends. Um, yeah, you want to... It's not even extra goodies, Iggy. You want a story. Or you want to take the model off the base. Um, yeah, it's, it's... You want... Like I said, you want to tell your story in as small a space as you can. And don't worry, this is a mistake everybody makes. I made it back in the day too. Is like, you think, oh, I want a big, big base with a lot of crap on it. But if you're just throwing stuff on there and it doesn't say anything, it doesn't tell a story, then it's like useless. It's, it's just like filler. And if you think us judges can't spot that a mile away, <laughs> we can. <laughs> so it's, uh, but it's a thing a lot of people don't talk about with basing, like relative sizing and, and storytelling and doing that sort of thing. And it, it really is far more effective to just ask yourself, how little space do I need? Because if you can build up instead of out, you're going to get a more dynamic base. So like if you've got two models fighting, but you put one of them, instead of spreading out and giving them room that way, you put them kind of tilted and one of them is up and that's how you fit them on a smaller base. You get a much more exciting scene out of that. So think about it dynamically. Think about it verticality versus width. When you have a big flat base, it's really boring. Like visually, it's very boring. You're, you're making a very stable surface. So that's why I didn't go with the bigger base for her here. It's like, unless I got a story to tell, it's going to make this space exciting. It's just going to sit there and not do anything. 
So yeah, yeah. Right, right. And that's fine, Otter. Um, but if you ever do decide to do a display mini, like if you ever decide you want to do like something for ReaperCon and make it more interesting, then this is information for you. Um, I do always think about my basing a little bit more, even if it's like, this is just a gaming model. It's like, she's not, right now she's just for me. She's not for anybody, though I might send her to Ron, I guess, if he wants her. Um, but uh, I still want it to look good. I still want it to look like pleasing as far as its arrangement goes. So I will definitely muck around with it. But I think this is the right height. So I'm going to take some glue. I'm probably going to use a gel glue for this because it makes sense. It's further not going to run the risk of seeping down. And it's going to stick the cork down pretty well. Um, more fluid super glues tend to be absorbed by cork. And sometimes you don't get as good a stick that way. So I have gone to uh, utilizing jelly glue. Jelly glue. Let's get closer. And this is the Loctite Ultra Gel. I tend to go like one way or the other um, dramatically. So for me, here we go. Stay. Splurk. Right down on top. I want to leave a little room toward the back so that I can build that out. I can, after this is glued down, obviously I can take my knife and kind of chip away at it and make it even more interesting if I want to use parts of this in my base. Um, I totally can do that. Uh, David, for his dragon base, like left raw cork sticking out here and there and then did a bunch of wood putty work to texture it um, and used both textures on his base. So he got a very natural looking base for his dragon because it looks like he's got chunks of rock sticking up out of earth. Uh, so that works really well. Yeah, you could totally game with this size base. It just makes it look a little more impressive, right? If she's a character, like if she's like an actual big villain, like if she's your final boss, the snake lady shaman who's evil... Or, or just really pissed off that you're in her temple, <laughs> uh, then yeah, then a little extra time. And as you can see, though, setting this up isn't taking me much time. I'm talking a lot. But if I just sat down to do this, this would be really fast. So in, if I wasn't explaining everything as I went along, this would be super quick. So... Yeah, exactly. If you just want to do something generic for tabletop, that makes sense. If you're doing a big boss, though, who's in a specific module, like if you're in Isle of the Dead and you're in your, you know, your end temple where the giant pearl is and you want your big end boss, that makes sense to base up a little specific. That can be fun and it can give more atmosphere to the adventure, right? So if you have time, I know like everybody with gaming, it's like if you have time to ever even paint your mooks, then that's impressive. But for final bosses or important characters, then I know a lot of GMs who do like to make that last boss look impressive. So, you know, that kind of thing. And she's not going to be super specific either. Like she's going to be on a rocky base with a pool of moisture. That could be temple, that could be cave, that could be jungle. That could be any of these things. Um, even, even cold, wet, like shoreline, like temperate shoreline could be that. So yeah, make the last boss look impressive. Well, come on, you've spent all this time planning a game, running a game, herding cats to get everybody together to play your game. So why not spend extra time on your big baddie? And then you've got a nicely painted figure on a cool base for your collection. So where's the, where's the, I don't see a downside here. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Something cool and and uh, and fun. Like, because when when you love mini painting, but you most of your mini painting is gaming mini painting for D and D or something, then it can be really fun to actually like put a little bit more time into something that's important. Like with Warhammer, I was always guilty of trying to make my general or my monster look a lot better than my random guys, you know. And and I think that's where that's what I usually tell people if they're starting with Warhammer. It's like paint your normal guys fast and clean. But then if you want to spend time and get better, put that on your character figures, right? They're at least going to stick around usually more than for more than one cannonball. <laughs> I played a lot of, against a lot of Empire back in the day. <laughs> um, yeah, and don't forget hurting your players to follow the quests they created. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Hey, math file. Yeah, so, so you put all this time into your D&D game. It, it makes sense that if you've got a cool character final boss that you do just a little extra basing. Mm, so this isn't totally like non-applicable to people who are painting for D&D. &D. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and you get to indulge your, your mini painting and maybe paint something not as fast so you don't feel like you're as pressured. You can take your time and maybe even learn a couple of new techniques and enjoy yourself, right? So, I mean, she's already a cool end boss because she's got the cool lighting effects. So she's already super dramatic and awesome. 
I always wanted to, since Reaper is coming out with all the dinosaurs that we did last Kickstarter, I, uh, I've been wanting to run Isle of Dread, like just revamp the Isle of Dread uh, maps and module and just like run something new in it. Um, very badly, <laughs> but with COVID, we haven't been, we haven't gotten a gaming group out here. Uh, David's old gaming group was more in downtown San Francisco. So we don't have a, we don't have people for me to subject my GMing to yet. <laughs> eventually, eventually we'll get there. All right. So we've got our nice cork glued down. We've decided that's about what we're going to do. Now we're going to throw green stuff at it. And I also need to, uh, green stuff. If I'm going to put her on the space, I can choose at this point to glue her down. Um, and I should, because when you're starting to sculpt around her, you do want her to stay put. Now, you can pin her to this base if you wanted to, especially if she was plastic. I probably would run a pin up into her. Because she's metal, it's a little harder to pin. I'm not as worried, because I've got a nice flat base here to be flat on the cork. I think she's going to adhere just fine, and then I can use green stuff to back it up. But you could pin th into this, and if so, I recommend pinning through the cork into the plastic. Um, that way you can even like maybe bend your pin against the bottom and put some green stuff, like just a dab of green stuff here to, to glue it down firmly so that the model is very, very solidly pinned. Since cork is so soft, it's not really good to pin into. Even I used to load it with super glue and that makes it brittle, but that's almost not as good. So usually if I was pinning this model to this base, I'd pin all the way through the cork into the plastic and I would even put a little cap of green stuff up to seal the wire so it didn't move. Um... Oh, do they? They use the Isle of Dread in the Savage Tide. That's good to know, Mighty Garrett, because it's just a classic, right? I mean, the module that came with the D&D Expert box set. It's just, it's such a classic, and it's so old school right now. But you can take that, like, the maps are great. Like, you can take the environment and the maps and just make something new and cool. If we do it online. Yeah, I guess I could easily with you guys. I bet I could easily GM a game online. What's the best online uh, online um, gaming platform in your uh, in your opinion, guys? I'm curious. For those of you who are maybe gaming online, um, what's the best one in your opinion and why? For running games online. I'm going to glue down Snake here. I know, I know a lot of people use Roll20, but I, I've never used one, so I have personally no idea. Uh, um, wood putty, actually wavy. We've got, uh, David's got it over on his desk. It's like, it's like the green stuff epoxy. I don't know where he stuffed it and he's not in here cause he's in a meeting, but it's actually a wood putty I've covered in other streams. It's like, a you, it's epoxy. It's two part. You mix them together. Um, and then it, it, you can just use it. It's real cheap. So you can use it as a nice bulker. Um, so, okay. For right away, though, I need to position snake. I need to figure out. Let's see, where's she looking? Do I want her looking more toward the front? That's more of an oblique angle. It's more interesting. Yeah, I like that. Because since I have chosen to make more out front here, there's a definite front to this base now, and I need to look at what orientation. I don't want her looking too far off to the side. I don't want that. I think this is her best angle. So kind of just slightly oblique, looking off a little bit to the right. So I'm going to let her now set on top of this cork with that super glue, and she'll, she'll stick down very quickly. Uh, hold on. Let me look. Let me look. Let me look. Let me see. I, I want to, I was actually asked this question because I was actually interested. So roll 20 using roll 20 theater of the mind. I'll look at all of these fantasy grounds, fantasy grounds. Huh? I like the idea of that grounds roll 20. Because, yeah, we have some people who we could probably drag into a game. And then what was the other one? Theater of the Mind. Thanks for sharing this, guy. you guys. Are we using Roll20 for a ReaperCon, or does it depend on the GM, or are we doing that at all, Justin? Do we have events? We are using uh, Warhorn, and I believe Warhorn kind of organized all that. Oh, okay. Partial to Fantasy Grounds. But I believe it's... I think we've got individual games people can set up, too. So it's... Less of it is governed by Reaper itself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay, okay. War Warhorn is just for scheduling. It is. But it depends on the GM. Correct. I, that's what I'm saying is we went through Warhorn and then they kind of distributed it to people to kind of say, hey, use what you want to use. Right, right. 
Crowley Hamster, how do you feel about parts of the basing sticking out over the edge of the base? Um, I like it for some models. What I, I mean, I obviously did it intentionally for Frost Giant Queen, um, where her base is, is actually built that way, right? So I actually utilized the base to do that. I find when you're using these big wooden plinths for basing that it really, um, it helps a lot to just kind of spice them up a little bit. I don't like just using the big block, uh, if it's just a blank block. But um, thanks for the suggestions, guys, on the RPG stuff. I'll look at um, I'll look at Fantasy Grounds and see how it compares. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're trying to be more dynamic, Crowley Hamster, then I think leaving parts of the basing sticking out could be fun and awesome. Um, but on the other hand, I usually will not have them protrude over the edge of this base, like not on this level. Like I wouldn't have anything sculpted going out over the edge of this base because this is the base that I'm holding onto to keep from harming the rest of the figure, especially if she's a gaming model. So if I was going to have anything extend over the edge of the base, I would have it extend up higher. Like I might build out this cork a little bit to extend a little bit to, to give her a shelf that kind of expands over the edge. This is especially useful if you're doing a model that's lunging forward, then you can have like kind of a promontory of rock extending over the front of the base. And that can look very good indeed. Um, but I try not to put anything uh, extending over the base on the plastic level because I want it, uh, I want this plastic to, I want to be able to hold onto it without breaking or, or, you know, rubbing something off. So uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Astral. That's a one I haven't heard of. Shard Tabletop Foundry. More more looking at what you guys think are the best ones. Because I could look at... I understand there's 60 zillion of them out there, but I don't have the time to go in and check all of them. So, Shard Tabletop. I'll look at that. But don't just, like, shout out all the ones you've heard of because I'm more interested in you guys' opinion because you're probably doing this a lot more than I am and already have, like, a, a very good opinion set on why why you like it. Uh-oh. Drop the pen cap. Oh, no. My pen will be dead unless I find it. I hate it when I do that. Dang it. Oh, well. Pen, you might be dead. I don't think I can take time off stream to find the cap. And it could be anywhere because floor of hobby room. You know how that goes. Which is sad because I like this pen. One second. I am going to take a little... Oh, there it is. Okay, I found it. If I hadn't found it, I wouldn't have taken the time. There we go. Yay! Pen salvaged! All right. Let's get to get to green stuffing this sucker. And if I was going to, by the way, guys, if I was going to do like a base that projected out a bit over the lip of here, what I would have done first before I glued her down is probably put a thin layer of plastic card down to make kind of an armature for that so that I would have something solid to sculpt onto. All right. Do, do, do. Oh, cool. Battle maps. Neat. Right, right. Fantasy Grounds. Seeing a lot of people saying that Fantasy Grounds is cool. Very video gaming for Astral. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Note about Fantasy Grounds that it needs a standard license. The GM needs the ultimate license, and players can just use the free version. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I am definitely money conscious these days since I'm working for myself, guys. So that's a good that's a good thing to mention. All right. I don't so much mind scale. All right. Interesting. All good. Thanks, Eridest, for the vote for Foundry. I'll put it down. Do, do, do. You guys have given me a lot to look at. Thank you. Thank you for all the suggestions. All right. David, remind me what the wood putty is called. People were asking, and I uh, didn't have the tube in front of me. 
Uh, I'm going to try to get PC through this chat. PC Lumber. PC Lumber, that's right. So it is a wood putty. There's quite a bit of it in the giant tube. I mean, it's not actually in any way wood. It's just meant to be kind of for wood repairs. Right. That that's what I mean by wood putty. That's, I think, what the standard Yeah, I mean, I is. call it wood putty, too. I was just yeah. clarifying for your audience. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Thanks for this, the Prime sub, Crowley. Awesome. Fantastic. Alright. Um, yeah, you could use Milliput for this, too, Chibi. Absolutely. I mean, consider with base sculpting, you guys can consider that any putty is fine. Um, it's just, it, it's all, you know, what you like to work with, what has the right texture for you, what's the price point you want, you know. Um, I like that PC lumber stuff because of the relative hardness and how well it takes texture. Um, I've, I've really gotten to be kind of fond of it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly why I like it. It cures really hard. It cures very quickly relative to other putties. It's good at taking textures and it's good at sort of simulating textures. Like, um, you know, one thing that most putties have is that if you kind of smear them, um, they'll tear a little bit. And this, the PC Lumber putty, it tears very, very easily, which gives it like a really nice texture for rocks and um, that kind of thing. Although it would be terrible for sculpting organic shapes. Good to know. Ah, my green, this is old green stuff and it wants to stick to its paper really, really, or it's plastic a lot. All right, I need a lot of it though. I'm using up this last chunk of green. Remember that the middle of the green stuff ribbon is where it's curing against the blue, so you don't want that. You want all the rest of it. Um, I could go like 50-50 on this since I'm not using this to like blend into anything really, um, if I wanted to use up all the rest of this ribbon. When I'm doing gap filling with green, I always go with a lot more yellow than blue. But for basing stuff, that's not really necessary unless you're trying to do something where you're blending it into another integral base, which a little bit I am here with snake, but not a lot. Uh, mostly this is just so old and sticky that I want to use up the rest of this green. And of course I'm getting it all over myself. Yay. Not. All right. There. It wants to stick under your fingernails. It wants to stick everywhere. Um... Will you hand me the tube of PC lumber, David, for uh, reference for the folks? Sure, the... this is a full tube. I will hand it right back to you. We just have uh, Dragon Eye is asking for it. It comes in the same tube as Green Stuff does, um, Dragon Eye. So it's PC lumber, epoxy putty. Yep. Wood For wood repairs and stuff like that. Um, but it's got a definite different... It's not as sticky, nearly as sticky as green stuff, although it is and sticky enough to like stick to some it things. It does leave a sticky residue. Yeah, that's good enough. On your hands, which is one downside. There you go, Dragon Eye. PC lumber. So, yeah, since David introduced me to that, I really have gotten to like that. Trying to get a little bit more blue into the screen. Oh, this is so sticky. This green is so old. Sometimes I find the older the green stuff, the more sticky and goopy it gets. I hate it. Yeah, I know I could, but I don't have gloves with me. I could gloves. Except that problem with green is it'll stick to the gloves even worse. Ah, <laughs> uh, can't do it. Can't do it. Seven ninety nine at Ace Hardware. There you go. And a little of it goes a long way, just like with green. So if you're doing big bulking, that's why you use cork for a lot of it. And then you use the PC lumber to like stick parts together, make kind of bridging, bridging material between the chunks of cork, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Cork is really good for, for planning out, especially because you don't want it to be too heavy and awful. Um, just there's a lot of materials out there that are just way too heavy that you can use for bulking. But I like cork for that reason. It's so lightweight. Um, the PC lumber isn't smelly. I don't think is it David I didn't no, notice really. it no more than I mean green I has a it, green has a slight like... odor yeah but it's not like super smelly it's not gonna fumigate you hopefully unless you're really sensitive to smell then you might find it annoying but I didn't really notice it afternoon zambies 
we are about to throw a bunch of green stuff at a snake base. And I probably don't have nearly enough green stuff, so I have a lot. I'm trying to decide whether I want to do a ribbon. I think I want to do the front of the base and the groundwork. So let's put this. This is definitely dead. The old, the, the remnant of the green stuff plastic is definitely going in the trash. And this will go over here on this plastic. Oh, automotive putties. Yeah, but this is a wood filler putty. And usually when you're doing wood repairs, you're doing it to chairs and stuff. You don't want it to be real stinky. So I'd imagine that's why it's a little bit better. Ooh, all right. $7.29 on Amazon next day prime. Good to know, Val. All right, let's do some rocks. Time to rock. And to start with my rocks, I'm going to use Giant Spoon. Giant Spoon is going to just press our rock, our, our putty roughly where we want it, a little bit irregularly. Um, I'm keeping a bit of cork around in case I want to throw in some uh, more rough, rocky texture. Um, I often use cork as a stamp where I will just press it onto the green to get a nice irregular organic texture. It works great that way. I especially like this fine cork for that. All right, so here is our sculpting tool. Here is our water. Obviously, since we're working with a painted model, I do not want to have to mess around with uh, putting Vaseline on this sculpting tool and having to wash the entire model afterwards. I do want this green to go up over her base because we're trying to disguise the fact that she has an integral base. Don't lose uh, sight of that. But I may take some of this green off and do a ribbon where I'm just disguising the upper part here and leaving some of that lower texture. Let's see here. Shipping is more than the product. Oops. Yeah. Well, I mean, but you could find a wood putty in the UK, Wavy. I mean, that's just uh, trying to find a, a, a look up like epoxy putty for wood repairs and see if you can find something that's in, you know, use your Google Foo find something that's in the UK. I'm sure they have an equivalent product or something close that's for the same purpose. Might not be exactly the same, but so let's try to do a snake, haha, of, um, of green over here and uh, kind of go down into the cork for some of it. Really, I just want irregular shapes because it's all rock. I could use wood putty for this, by the way, instead of green, but I, I kind of had it in mind to do a bit of sculpting. I probably could still use wood putty if I'm just doing texture, but I had green to hand. I didn't want to open David's new tube of, uh, of wood putty, and I, I think we've lost the old tube. Have we, have we misplaced it? We couldn't find it the other day. Just kind of sticking little bits of green. The green is really fresh, so we've got lots of working time. We don't have to rush. I just want to cover up this base of hers with a thin skin of it. I don't want to cover over her, so I have to be careful when I get close to her tail. I might have to use my pokey tool to make sure that the green isn't uh, too close. So using something with a finer tip like this is uh, makes it easier for you to control where the green is going so that you can get it right up against her tail without going overboard. You want this thin skin because in a moment, we're gonna use some, torque, some cork and add texture. And I'm gonna press this up over here. I got a little bit of water under the green there, so that's gonna take a while to evaporate. I might just grab a Kleenex and take some of that water out of there, but it's still gonna to have to dry out before that green sticks better. That's a mistake that's easy to make when you're using water. Because the water tends to get sucked places by capillary action, it will often go under your green and that will keep your green from sticking. So the best you can do is kind of push it to where you need it to be and then uh, continue elsewhere and come back to it. Ah, oh no. Well, that definitely is where the edge of the base is. I'm going to just leave an irregular lump there. Yeah, that's terrible for you, Mighty Garrett. Be aware that green stuff is not non-toxic. That's why I use water. Or if I need to use spit for something, I will actually lick my thumb and roll my sculpting tool in that. But don't lick your sculpting tools. Trust me. 
not uh, not non toxic stuff. That's that's the reason you always want to wash your hands after you've using green stuff before you eat. It's not ah oh no not enough water in the tool. There we go. There, little ball of putty. Again, I'm going to use the chisel tool up here because I want the putty to go near the snake, but I don't want to uh, obscure details from the sculpt. Uh, I got a little bit too much water on there. And if I get some chunks on the screen, I'm not blending it in. I'm leaving some irregularities. Yeah, I totally got too much water up top there. Oh, we're just going to bring this up and over. And I'm going to leave some globs and stuff because I can texture that and make it blend in together. Irregular shapes are good when you're suggesting rocks. I'm going to grab that Kleenex again and wick off some of that water that I unwisely got everywhere. I just use the edge to just slurp some of it away and then that'll dry out a lot faster and I can go back. So I've got this area down here on the base that's got some irregularities and pretty much if I get some random shapes, I may just work with them. Like I kind of thought that I wanted kind of like rock columns and chunks going upward here. I may need a little bit more. I'll do that. Let me see if I can press this down a little bit up top. Again, we're trying to kind of disguise the base. It's fine to just make an edge and come back and fill it in later. Um, but what we really want to do is grab a piece of cork that has a nice irregular edge. Sometimes you might want to kind of create, kind of chunk it around and create one. And make sure I've got enough fluid on there. Sometimes you want to wait a little longer till this sets up, or you can add a thin layer of water over the top so your cork doesn't stick. And then you can do pressy things with it and make it much more like rock. And stamps are great with green stuff, as we all know, but I just tend to make my own stamps. So look, rock. And then, so I've got a nice irregular texture here, nice stony irregular texture. Now the fact that I'm doing this now means that the texture is going to be a lot more dramatic. If I waited until the green set up a little bit, my texture would be a lot more subtle. But what this does is it lets me put the same sort of texture on the green as exists on our cork. So all of this, cork and not cork, will blend in together. Uh, green stuff versus milliput. Um, I mean, texture paste, I don't like. It's just a little goopy. I can't really sculpt with texture paste um, very much. Like Sarduki, if I wanted to make a nice, a couple of nice rocks down here, and like I wanna, I wanna kind of sculpt a little pool of water, a couple pools of water um, recesses, uh, texture paste isn't going to allow me to do that. Green stuff can be filled with fluid after it is cured, so I can essentially create little pools down here. Um, millipod, I'm guessing once it cures, you could do the same, uh, but I don't know enough about millipod on that score. Millipod has the nice advantage that just like Abe's epoxy sculpt, it can be thinned with water um, while it is still active, I believe, which can be a plus for some things. Uh, all of these putties have different, different, um, like kind of wheelhouses. So what you shouldn't be asking is which putty is best, but which putty is best for this purpose. For me, I prefer green for this sort of work. Um, I used to do Aves. I don't know, but I like th having the freedom to come in and then go, all right, I want this to be a smoother rock. And now I can actually take my sculpting tools and sculpt a smoother rock coming out of this area. Whereas with texture paste, I can't really do that. Um, like if I want to grab more green. With texture paste, it's just going to be texture paste, no matter what. And you also, with texture paste, if you tried to use a press mold like the piece of cork, it would just kind of goop. It wouldn't necessarily hold that texture very well. It's not set up to do that. It's just set up to create a random texture. Um, milliput would act a lot like this, though, and you could certainly use milliput for this purpose. I just am not enamored of milliput. I never really took to it. So for me, um, as time has gone on, I like uh, I like green stuff more and more as I 
as I realize that I've gotten better with it, as I've gotten to really understand it, I like what green can do. So if I want a smoother rock here, kind of coming out of that surface, I can put some angular features on it if I use a more of a shovel tool. So that lets me put a rock in front of her, kind of coming a bigger chunk of rock coming out of this uh, substrate. And it putting something like this on here, one, I can, I can work it right into the green stuff, right? I can use my sculpting tool to texture it because it's green stuff itself. It's a little easier. Um, but I can also make it make it less obvious that this is just a fill right if when i put a rock here when i put a like dip or a pool here i'm essentially disguising the fact that we're just pretty much putting a base on top of a chunk of cork and trying to make something a little bit more interesting um so i do like because i'm doing going to do a bit of rock sculpting um i do like green for this Um, no, I haven't. Liquid green stuff just seems silly to me, Liquid Nebula. Like, essentially, you're just... They're trying to make it a better gap filler, like, to reduce the learning curve. The point of liquid green stuff is is to reduce the learning curve on gap filling with green. Um, but all I've heard about it is that it's terribly goopy and hard to learn to use. At that point, I'd just rather use green. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, texture paste is hard to use. Yeah, if you want control, if you want control, I think that you kind of go away from paste and liquid applications and you go towards solids that will retain texture and let you put them exactly where you want them. Yeah, that's Games Workshop's product planning right there. <laughs> Oops, my pot of this dried up. Like, I'm going to have to work to make sure my, my new Valhalla snow paste doesn't go uh, the way of the dodo, so to speak. Because I could see how it would create some interesting snow effects. All right, so let's go over here and kind of start on making something in the front. So let's put a ribbon of green down. This time I'm going to grab one of my clay shapers so that I can kind of smooth it down into these cracks a little bit. Clay shaper, yay! And of course the green stuff's going to adhere just fine to the paper sticky note that we put down. Uh, but now I do need a little bit more of my... Where's my spade? There's my spade. I like... These are my favorite like tools with, with um, metal tools. The spade shapes and then Mighty Spoon. Gigantispoon. Um, I do find that I want a metal tool here and there because like I tried to use the clay shaper here, but it's not strong enough to really press this putty down and get it thin. So if I want to do that, then I need to work with a tool that's uh, hard enough to get that working. And I do want to seal the bottom of this base with green if I'm going to pour any sort of like gloss medium or water medium into it, into puddles. So I want to make sure that I've got a nice thin layer of green over the area that I want to do that water effect in. So that we don't get any seepage. Seepage is not fun. Well, at least not in this context. Although I think the very nature of seepage is probably not good. Well, I guess no. My water filter uses seepage, so I guess there are some good applications for seepage. It's not entirely a negative word. We are getting, yeah, we are getting late. Hmm, yeah, so I'm going to continue skin, putting the skin, skinning this uh, green stuff, making sure that's pressed up against my rock texture. I'm going to be making more rocks. I'm going to be making a little... This might be where actually, since you asked about making parts of a base project, I might do that. I might actually build up a little bit of a pool, like up a little bit, um, like at a second level. So it's not just a ground level. At a snake level, there might be an intermediary level with a pool um, of rock. That could be cool. So I may do that. 
is trying to double check my rock up top here and make sure that it looks like it's blended in, not forget the back side of it. Now it's a little drier up here. I can push this green stuff a little further towards Snake. Just need to get it close to her belly. Don't want it very um, thick, so I can stretch it really, really thin. Just needs to be there to get the texture there so that it's all skinned up and looks good. So this is actually, I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out so far. Let me grab the rest of my green. We'll go a little over today just because of the cure emergency. And I'm gonna make a skin of green down here on the other side. Haven't uh, decorated up this part of the rock much yet, but that could be good. It might give me opportunities. There we go. So Mighty Spoon can be really useful for this as long as you've got a big enough space. But remember to put water down. If you've got water on the plastic base and you want the green stuff to go over that area, one thing you can do is press really hard and kind of slide it. And sometimes you can just kind of press the green and squeeze the water out ahead of it so that it does stick, which is what I'm doing here. So I've gotten that to adhere, even though there was water originally on the surface, just by grabbing the green and pressing it outward and squeezing the water ahead of it. There. Now this is just a skin that I'm going to build on top of, so I'm not bothering with much texture on it yet. If I did decide I wanted texture, I've still got some open time on this to, uh, to introduce that texture. I think I may put a little bit of a protruding edge over here because I've already got a little bit of cork that's that's uh, coming out. So if I'm going to do like a pool that kind of is in a little basin here, um, then that's a that's a good thought. I might have a protruding edge, edge here and a protrusion here to kind of show that this whole area is uh, kind of a system of ledges in a cave or something like that. Um, I am I did kind of have a messy area here. That I'm going in. I've got a little bit of green stuff that isn't textured into that area. So I'm getting in there and making sure that that little bit of green is not too disruptive. And if I really feel like I need to stuff it back there, I can dip my spade sculpting tool in water and just stuff, do that. And if I feel like I need this a little more irregular, I can kind of scrape little irregularities in it. Of course, it's much easier to kind of build out and down since you can't really cut into the metal base very effectively. So the only thing there you can do is kind of build up around it. But this is this is coming. And some of this irregular stuff, I could put some moss or things on that to show again that it's kind of a, a verdant area. Oh, well, you know, you can always use green stuff, Gergi. That's a very old model. I always hate it when it comes, like when I used to order stuff or pick stuff off of a melt table, if it was already kind of put together, I always was annoyed by it. Because usually they wouldn't put it together as well as I could. Little bit more of green over here. Ah, get in there. Ah, sometimes the green wants to stick to you more than it wants to stick to everything else. This is what green does. This is why people are horribly annoyed at it. There. All right, so I want that ledge, but I don't. Let me see here. I'm gonna kind of work up around this. I'm gonna use this ledge as a stepping off point. I might build it up by her tail and uh, make it more project off of the original base. Um, this is where I might use green stuff as its own armature, where I'm, I'm widening out this little cork shelf by putting a blob of green over here, kind of skinning it over the surface of that little ledge and uh, deciding to build off of it later. So for right now, I'm gonna sculpt it as a little protruding rock. So I can come back and work with it more. And it, its presence also helps disguise this edge. So again, what we're doing is we're trying to vary the surfaces here and disguise the fact that she even had an integral base. 
And the more thicker and thinner and textured and non-textured um, stuff we can put over the lip that kind of disrupts that silhouette, the more that you're going to get, the more you're going to get that effect. I'm probably going to leave this little cork hollow here, little cave of sorts. I might even over time, since I left the cork down here, I can still dig it out a little bit. Um, so if I decide I want this hole to be a little deeper, the cork lets me do that. And that's the advantage of like leaving some areas just being natural cork if you uh, if you're recessing them. So you can kind of play with your tool and dig it out and make it more of a cave there. Um, and that lets you put more dimension. Your, your figure just isn't sitting on then a, a stack of circuit cylinders or a stack of slices of whatever. Um, if you can dig out part of it, that gives it more three-dimensionality and likewise makes it more visually interesting. You could, Valandar, exactly. You could make a snake. That is one of many things you could do. Put some bones in there if you really hollowed it out. But yeah, so, and, and these little cork uh, bits, probably just going to tamp into the green stuff. It's again, it's a little extra texture. Why would I get rid of it? Um, as long as it's not disruptive. So that's starting to look pretty good. And then we've got this, we got to decide what we're going to do down here. Um, if I decided to make this entire area a pool of water, that would be another thing um, that I might want to do. Um, my cork, though, might absorb some of that. In that case, I might want to build up a little lip down here if I was going to make this whole area a water pour. And I'd also have to put a little bit of a lip around the outside here. You have the plastic base lip, but since we've put down a skin of green to give this area a little bit more texture, um, we, of course, have uh, we don't have as much depth to this plastic lip as we have as we had before. So we have to think about that if we're going to go there. I'll probably continue this on Monday. I do like sculpting and building bases. I think it's fun. It lets you, it lets you give so much more personality to a figure that already has a ton of personality. She's going to look a lot better on this base. Um, oh, thanks for the sub, Lady Dyer. Hey, we have actually got a new emote thanks to you. <laughs> so so my twitch is telling me <laughs> awesome yes thank you for the sub all right so we've got a cave and we've got that we've got, got some irregular stuff going on I'm thinking about chewing out some of this this is a little too regular over here it projects out um, I mean I could keep it I guess if I wanted the cork texture over here I'm trying to decide if I want it or not like, it, it does make more interesting shapes if you do, like, dug out shapes rather than um, just layered up shapes. But I've got some undercut back here, and I'm probably going to, like, keep that kind of recessed. Uh, so maybe I do want to just build out from here. Or maybe I want to chunk it a little and make it blend in with the green, but leave the cork texture except for the top. An X-Acto knife is ideal for this. A sculpting tool with a sharp point is fine. Just kind of kind of dig away. The big chunky cork actually chunks a lot easier than this. The little cork is more compressed. So you may have to play with it more like I'm doing to get it to chunk out and flake off. But I wanted it a little more, a little more irregular over there. It was getting a little bit too regular. Um, usually I'll use like white glue, PVA glue, daffod weir. Um, if I like the texture, I find that a good solid layer of glue, uh, works well to kind of cement everything. And it helps give it a little bit more strength. The glue will kind of soak into some surfaces and go down in crevices. Um, it'll also make a good base to paint over. Um, and you can seal it afterwards if you want. All right, let's get this bottom side. Yeah, no problem. When it comes down to it, though, a good thick layer of latex paint will do much the same, Daffod Weir. So there are definitely... Uh, paint can be used to, to reinforce cork in that same way. White glue and paint have a lot in common chemistry-wise. Like, I have had a chemist look at me and tell me flat out that glue was paint and paint was glue, and that was it. It's, like, made the same way. Um, so uh, you could probably also just use a thick layer of paint. You'd be fine. Oh, I see. I left some sculpting artifacts there. I need to fix that. So I want to do a little bit of camouflage here. 
Come on, stick to the model, not to me. Green stuff is getting persnickety as it gets older. I did, I do see that I left a little bit of uh, sculpting tool texture here under the rocks, so I want to go back in. Also, the older the green stuff gets, the more it cures, the less water you need or to, on your sculpting tool to keep it from sticking. There we go. Got rid of some of that texture. Want to keep that. Sometimes the random tool mark texture that you get can suggest like little pieces of rock or things that you can work in to the base that will help you um, build out areas so that it's like, well, this is dirt, but this is stone. Some of this uh, cork could easily be earth instead of rock, and I could maybe do some plants if I wanted to, if I wanted to put her on a jungle base, like Mathophile was originally asking if I would do. But I have very little bung jungle base materials. I don't know if I have enough excess to really uh, put on this model, spare for this model. I need to contact uh, Greg and ask him if he's got ferns that I can buy. I'm sure he does. Do you know, guys know if Greg Zuniga has like an Etsy store or something where he sells the parchment stuff? May as well ask the community. You guys have a better chance of knowing than I do since I haven't like gone looking. Ah. The vellum stuff, I should say. Oh yeah, for sure, Lady Dyer. Pin that down. Yeah, the green is definitely getting to the point where it doesn't want to stick as well. It's uh, Then you have to really press it down to get it to adhere. So at this point now, I'm just probably getting to the point where I need to use my green. He does. Zewo, do you know the name of the store so I could Google it? Don't, don't need to link it or anything, but... Making kind of a stony area here so that I can use up my green and disguise this base. This would also be a good, like, it's a way to put an irregular edge around. Just kind of use the cork and shape shape your, uh, your area around it. You'll notice I'm using a lot less clay shapers when I'm actually sculpting like this than I was using to do, like, say, fill work. I think that for filling and blending, clay shapers are awesome, but for sculpting, I actually prefer, for me, I prefer the harder tools. Uh, oh, right. Wicked Elf Miniatures, right? Yeah. Let me make a note. See, it's a good thing my pen didn't uh, dry out. I remember that now that you say that. It's Wicked Elf. Oh, Secret Weapon is carrying them? Yeah. I like to buy direct if it's somebody that I know who's doing it. I like Secret Weapon and I like supporting them too, but um, both of them are local area or, or at least uh, are, are small businesses. But uh, given the choice, I think I'd want to give the money direct to Greg. So and that's just me as a, as a freelance artist, you know, you always rather... Although it's nice to have distribution of products, uh, you always rather that you get the money direct for the consumer if you can. All right, so I'm making some shapes there. Oh, good, Nomezi. Yeah, I could use some ferns, I was thinking the other day. I have a lot of, like, a jungle base. Uh, seems like people are interested in jungle bases, so if I can pick up some vellum stuff and uh, some paper stuff. Maybe we can uh, have some fun with that stuff someday. Probably do something for the Patreon on that. All right, so just trying to make some irregular shapes here. Um, 
kind of looking for more stones out here so I'm not using my cork stamp as much um, just trying to like make an irregular shape that disguises this thickness of stuff so here I've got a line that's much thinner than the snake base to kind of suggest that there's a thin layer of stone right there and then you know the thicker ones below it so this rock looks like it's bigger than this so again it's it's all about building up shapes to disguise um, the integral base uh, and make it make everything a little more interesting than just a flat cylinder on top of something oh good Good, I'm glad he's doing a jungle pack. I, I mentioned to him that I was having trouble finding stuff for jungle basing, so <laughs> Greg's always looking for ideas, so that's fantastic. I will go and uh, peruse and probably buy something. All right, making some rocks, just a regular stuff, a regular texture. Stone and earth. And we've got a pretty good base for stuff built up. My cork texture has relaxed a little bit since I first put it down, which is something that green stuff will do. It will take texture and then because it's kind of rubbery, it'll relax a little bit. Um, they used to put out a, a gray and brown stuff that was much better for sharp edges um, on that, on that uh, kind of thing. All right. Well, we're about quarter after. It's probably about time to wrap this. I've got at least a good start. I can let this set um, and think about how I want to do my pools. Think about if I want to do bottom pools or if I want to raise up my pools a little bit by, by doing a, a secondary layer of sculpted stone that rises up just a little bit here. I'm kind of leaning toward that for at least one pool. I might do a pool into a, into a lower pool. We might make this a lower pool and uh, put a, an upper pool over here and do like kind of a, a waterfall kind of pools. That would be fun. <laughs> In Ara, I have had so many people tell me that over the years. Mostly that I was berating them that they needed to thin their paint more <laughs> or put higher highlights on something. <laughs> oh no. You've got your inner Anne voice in your head telling you to do things. As long as I'm not telling anybody to break the law, I'm pretty okay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disavow that it's my voice if it starts telling you to do suspect things. Get in there, little green stuff. I'm trying to use up all my green at this point. Nearly every day for three months, so yeah. That's funny. At that point, I'm like a, a trigger. Especially if you're, you, if you're listening to me while you're painting. Then probably you just need to get in the mood for painting. All you need to do is start up a, a VOD of mine or a video. Because that's the way it happens. Like I, uh, when I'm listening to particular music for mini painting for more than like a couple weeks, then I, I hear a song from that and I immediately want to mini paint, even if I'm somewhere where mini painting is not, not at all practical. Um, that's habits for you. They can they can totally work for you. They can totally work to call the muse when you need it. But it also can lead to moments where you like, dang it. <laughs> There. And I'm going to grab the last chunk of green stuff and just try to skin over the back part of this. And that way I'll have used all my green before it all cured. And we will be set to do the next level, which is awesome. All right. This might be a little bit too much for this. Hmm. Green is always so deceptive. You think you've got just enough and then it turns out you have too much. And you think, or, you, or it turns out you don't have quite enough. But usually you have too much. Usually usually green expands relative to the project at hand. And I'm going to spread it really thin so I don't need it to be... Uh, I don't need a ton of it. There we go. And I've almost got all my sticky note skinned over at this point, which is nice. Oh, it's time for Tiny Spoon. Where are you, Tiny Spoon? There you are. Whenever there's a tiny space that is not good for Giant Spoon, Tiny Spoon to the rescue. Uh, 
So I learned something about the learning process the other day that I'd like to share for you guys just right here at the end of this. Um, and that is that, and you probably, those of you who, who um, like are interested in the learning process may already know this, but that our minds like tend to have a, a certain period of time where we're open and receptive to learning and then we start not retaining the things that we hear from then on. Um, and one of the optimal windows that they talk about is the 25 minute window. So like somewhere between, um, somewhere between 10 minutes and 30 minutes, your brain starts to like drop the stuff that you've been learning, like as you listen to a class or you listen to a, a thing. And the way that you can get around that, especially if you're listening to this on VOD, um, is you can listen to 25 minutes of it and then stop and practice. Uh, take a five minute break and stop and practice what you learned. So I'm thinking about actually structuring some of my classes like this in the future, where we do a, a learning thing for 25 minutes and then everybody stops and practices it. And I'm wondering, because it's supposed to, studies say that it, uh, it's supposed to let you retain a lot better because it essentially by, by practicing the thing you were just hearing about or seeing done um, within right after that, you know, within half an hour of essentially learning it, uh, you will have a much higher chance of retaining it usefully. So, uh, if you're li listening to this on VOD and you see me do something that's cool, think about pausing and spending five or 10 minutes playing with the green and seeing what I'm talking about or trying to do cork texture or, you know, just anything that you think you might want to remember for later. Hey, thanks for the raid roll. We are about to like end. I just spent, uh, I, well, I just spent time uh, talking philosophy of learning to everybody, but, uh, but yeah, we were, we're taking snake lady now and we're making her a base. And so I started with cork. I talked a lot about what, how to choose the right size of base. And then we kind of bulked out where we're essentially disguising her integral base, which is just like a flat coin almost is very uninteresting. Um, <laughs> Well, and that's true, right, Roll? It's all, everybody's different. They're talking purely on averages here. So if it's a 15-minute rule for you and you know that, then listen to something for like 15 minutes and then take five-minute break and write down key points about the thing you were just listening to. Um, and maybe if it's something like this, practice. Um, and it's really, it will, it should really, really help your retention. And when you're trying to learn a technique for mini painting, I think that's really important because we tend to like just watch these long videos um, and then we go on to the next video, right? And we don't actually stop and utilize the things that we're learning. And so we probably are going to have to go back and watch that video again because your brain is going to start forgetting that in favor of um, what are we eating for lunch? <laughs> So yeah, welcome Raiders. Um, some of you, as, as Rule raids us a lot, you may know me. I am Anne from Reaper Miniatures. Today we are working on a base for our awesome snake lady. Um, I want to do some water pools and things like that, but we talked a lot. If you go back and watch this VOD later um, or catch it on YouTube after Justin gets it up, we talk a lot about how to choose the right size of base for your model, depending on what you're doing and if you're trying to tell a bigger story or uh, just make something scenic that puts the model in a particular place in time. Um... Well, right, math file. But that's, that just calls for experimentation, right? So, like, for me, I found that very interesting, and I decided I was going to try it. So now when I'm going to um, work, I'm working on learning some web stuff for my dog nonprofit. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to listen to that in, like, say, 10-minute chunks and take a five-minute break to implement and see if I retain it better than I do otherwise with other things. Um, it's just a very useful. I love learning hacks because I'm always trying to like learn something new or try something new. Um, and I'm always teaching, right? So I think that if you teach a lot, you can't help but be interested in learning and how people learn, right? Because you can make your classes so much more effective if you have an idea how people learn. So like when I'm structuring my class now for ReaperCon, if I structure that class in 25 or 20 minute chunks with a break of five minutes where people practice, then those people should walk out of my class with a, with a much better retention of the actual, you know, material. So I'm going to try it. I, I, I was very excited when I was reading about or listening. Actually, I was listening to an audiobook that was covering it. Um, and so I listen to a lot of audiobooks like that. I mean, they're self-help audiobooks, they're self-improvement audiobooks, but they talk a lot about learning and education and how our mind works. And I like that because it, it always gives me something new 
to maybe make me a better teacher and I'm all I'm all into that so always trying to improve always trying to improve the Anne is always trying to improve they say that our minds have limitless potential so you know may as well try to prove them wrong by learning as much as you can yeah Brian um, I, I mean, I like green stuff for this sort of thing, for taking a, an integral base that she's got there and uh, working with cork to bulk out and then sculpting rock and uh, earth textures over the top and maybe doing a bit of water effects. I mean, green is really good for this. It really, I think, is really, really good for this. And it lets me talk about green stuff technique. So now I've just been kind of smoothing in. I don't really know what this bottom part is going to be. If it's going to be kind of the bottom part of a, uh, you know, bottom shore of a pool of water or uh, what I'm going to do with it yet. Um, I was thinking about doing kind of a waterfall, a small waterfall cascade, but we'll see. Uh, and I need to build out the back of this. But yeah, I really do feel like green stuff, it takes a little bit. There's a little bit of a learning curve for green, but I feel like it's very good for this sort of thing. I really like it. And I used it to build out that shelf a little bit more there. So yeah, after years of hating green because I felt like, uh, you know, I, I was kind of self-taught, so I, I didn't have a lot of, uh, of help for that. But when I started working at Reaper, um, when you meet the sculptors and they're so eager to teach you everything, they're fantastic people. And so I got more comfortable with green over the years until I just realized the other day that I'm like, I'd become actually pretty good with this stuff. So I should probably use it more. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm reaching for it all the time. Yeah, exactly, AeroWiz. Yeah, you've got to, right? It's it's actually, that's proven too, neuroplasticity. So when you push yourself and try to like uh, find, absorb new concepts, open your mind to something new, um, you know, read things that, that like, just like this book, you know, that teach, taught me something new about learning that I might be able to use, that expands your mind and keeps your, keeps your neuroplasticity strong. And uh, when you stop learning uh, and you just kind of absorb everything, you know, and you just maybe watch TV all the time or whatever, then then your neuroplasticity suffers. So I always, I know, I, I tend to listen to a lot of sort of life hack and self-help and history and things, books that might like inform my current life when I'm uh, out walking in the evening. Yay. And sometimes right, just motivational that? stuff. Hey, are you back? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been back. I was kind of waiting for a, a, Oh, I mentioned uh, looking for a raid just a little while ago, but you must've missed it. Oh yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was here. I actually was, I was Rules. finding a raid that may have been when, uh, when Thanks, Outer Mama. It. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you were just distracted. Um, yes, exactly. But I do have a raid for us. Yes. That is lovely. Who are we raiding today? We are going to be raiding Miniatures Den. It's his uh, two-year anniversary streaming, so he's doing a big marathon stream. Oh, awesome! With incentives and other stuff, and giveaways too, I believe. So. Oh, sweet, awesome! So everybody, go over to Luca and uh, tell him he is awesome, and uh, definitely congratulate him on his two-year streaming. That's fantastic, man! I just started. I can't even imagine having done this for. Well, I mean, I just started my own. I can't. I obviously have been streaming probably for almost two years with Reaper. We should look that up, Justin. We should look up my stream anniversary. All right. Yeah, we can do that. Awesome. Yeah, Brian, I use water. I, uh, I because green is is not non toxic. I don't lick my sculpting tools, and I don't like using Vaseline because I have to wash the surface afterwards before I put paint on it. So if I, you know, I've gotten very used to using water, and I think I get pretty good res pretty good results. All righty. Yeah, we'll uh, uh, yeah, we'll come back. We'll keep working on this on Monday, guys. Maybe I'll, I'll think about doing a little waterfall. That would be kind of fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately anyway, just because I want to do some stuff like that. So, yes, we will have some fun. Say hi to Luca, and uh, I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend, all right? Bye-bye. Thank you guys very much. Keep being awesome. Uh, spread the Reaper love, of course. Tell Luca we said hi, although I'll probably stick by for uh, for a few minutes after we raid him and say hello. But uh, we have Reaper Land at 3 o'clock. We have the Bones 5 live update right after that. And then right after that, we have Reaper Aaron, which is our uh, three-hour D&D campaign with the artists and sculptors of Reaper. Um, and Nightheart is sponsoring it. So you guys should check all that out. Thank you very much, and we will talk to you later.